All right, Joe, uh, would you like to introduce this next speaker? Who is that exactly? I wonder. Uh, yeah. Professor Emeritus George Lucas has taught recently at Notre Dame and Case Western Universities. His 1989 book, The Rehabilitation of Whitehead, argued that Whitehead's process philosophy was not sui generis or primarily theological, but a sustained dialogue with Russell and other participants in the realism idealism debate in attempting to address sense data theory, Russell's logic, logical atomism, and find a solution to the mind body problem. His purchase of the long undiscovered papers, essays, and letters from Whitehead's grandson in 2018 led to the discovery of the full text of Whitehead's inaugural lecture at Harvard in September 1924, the final paragraph of which cemented this long disputed or overlooked claim. Uh, his paper today is reappraising Whitehead's engagement with other modern philosophers. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's start with audio quality. Um, can you hear me? Um, am I speaking loud enough? Okay, my mic is up here a little bit, so let me pull closer. I'm going to try to truncate my presentation a little bit just because I think it's a, a lesser intellectual caliber in a sense than what we've been hearing heretofore. Some really careful and thoughtful analysis of Whitehead's work. Uh, and mine is more of a kind of commentary on, frankly, the usefulness of this editions project uh, that have been led by Brian and Joe and Paul Bogard. Um, in the sense that um, I believe in the absence of the notes that we're reading now, uh, I believe against a lot of skeptics of the project, including people who review it for the National Endowment of the Humanities and don't give um, our, our um, directors the kind of funding they need uh, to really do this right, um, that we have to make a case that there's something in these lecture notes that you just wouldn't find uh, and that that material is not just interesting to Whiteheadian scholars, but to uh, philosophy in general. Um, so, of course, we found a lot of interesting stuff. That first lecture that, uh, that Joe just mentioned, um, if you haven't seen it yet, um, it's going to be in the two volumes uh, in its chronological order that Joe and Brian are editing now uh, that will be out soon, we hope. Um, and it's available otherwise online and uh, in an in a unedited edition in process studies uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, you should have a look at it uh, alongside Paul Bogard's uh, notes from Winthrop Bell in HL1, um, because they really shed a light on what Whitehead's project is that makes it look very different from what for decades had been taken to be the case. Um, so that's one thing, correcting our understanding of Whitehead. But um, uh, there's the other is, is mistakes that can be made in reading Whitehead himself. Uh, a famous one is the one I like to quote is uh, from Robin G. Collingwood, the great Oxford idealist, um, that uh, Whitehead, Sorry, Matt, uh, about your blog, but that Whitehead shouldn't be described as uh, philosophy as a series of footnotes to Plato. It should be a series, at least his own, of footnotes to Aristotle, and that Whitehead, not having read Aristotle, or really didn't realize this. Uh, Paul takes that on in volume one. I've taken it on before. I used to believe it was true and thought it was interesting and important to Aristotelianize Whitehead. Um, now we find if you read these lecture notes, you don't really need to do that at all. Whitehead was far more conversant, or at least far more engaged, let's put it that way, um, with, with Aristotle than one might have thought from just his published works where the mentions are kind of superficial and casual. And it's not alone uh, that Aristotle is short, um, given short shrift 
in Whitehead's published works, a lot of other philosophers that we believe and think must have been deeply influenced and that Whitehead, influential on Whitehead, and that Whitehead himself credits like William James and uh, um, Samuel Alexander. Um, we see the credits, but we don't see the, the work. We don't see the impact. We don't see Whitehead citing them the way he cited um, Descartes, for example. Uh, at length, and Spinoza, and Barclay, and, and so forth. Uh, so is, what happened? How could this be? And does it not raise questions about what we have long been taught, and what the skeptics will throw in our faces about this project? Namely, that Whitehead himself didn't want any work done on these materials. He didn't want people combing around in his knot glass, trying to figure out how he formulated his own ideas. Uh, instead, he wanted them to uh, work on their ideas, a perfectly reasonable position, but uh, it, it includes supposedly the, the claim by Whitehead that my curated published works are sufficient for you to understand me. We don't need any of this other stuff. And I think, well, there are a couple of things to be said about that. First, stop and think about it, and Joe, correct me in the questions if I'm wrong about this, but I think we have only Victor Lowe's um, word on this claim about Whitehead, um, that he thought his published works were sufficient. I don't know if he says anywhere other than viva voce through Victor Lowe that, um, that we shouldn't be wasting our time reading his stuff. We now have grounds in the project to suspect that what was really going on, quite frankly, was that he was he and his family members were telling Victor Lowe specifically, you should not be reading my stuff. You should not be writing my intellectual autobiography. You should go out and do your own work. Uh, and this was a sort of gentle way of, of brushing him off. Uh, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. But. What we did find um, in his books, uh, his published work, was, you know, not surprisingly, he credits his Harvard students and classes for this impact on these final compositions. And uh, Joe and Brian, in their fabulous introduction to this uh, second volume to HL2, um, give us reason to think that's not just the typical gracious non sequitur that a professor gives to his students that there's really now grounds in the lectures themselves for believing that that is a very true statement. Um, the predilection that he has, if he has it, for his published works actually does him a disservice because it makes it look like he doesn't know some of the materials that in fact he is engaged with in the lectures and which form the concepts that find their way into the published works, but not explicitly in the form of quotations, discussion, and footnotes. Um, so that's the, the sort of claim, that's what led to this project, or at least a continuation of it, because I've often been interested in, in you know, for example, how, how well did Whitehead know Hegel? Uh, he says he didn't know him, but is that true? Uh, frankly, now that the first two volumes are out, and I think we look at uh, Joan Kaywood's marvelous index and pour our way through the, um, the materials, but the mentions on Hegel that are in the lectures to his Harvard students verify his own judgment in 1940 uh, in the Schultz volume that, well, I never read much of Hegel, I didn't get much out of him, and, and so forth and so on. And yet, those of us who do read Hegel, uh, like Alessia um, and Deleuze and so many others see so many similarities. Uh, it's too bad, but that's one case where that position of Whitehead's self-characterization seems to be verified in the lectures he's giving to his students. Um, there are a number of other avenues, though, into his relationship to other philosophers. Um, his series of footnotes to Plato, uh, for example, uh, it's very odd in light of the importance that he constantly 
cites and attaches that he doesn't seem in the classes to assign any primary text from Plato or for that matter, anybody else. Uh, the, cl the classic texts he used are from the modern period almost exclusively, Descartes in particular, Barclay and Hume. Uh, Locke um, shows up uh, later in about the third year, I think, we find from Conger's notes. Uh, we don't have a syllabus and we don't really have a detailed reading list. We rely on what the students took down in their notes in these classes to say what it is they were expected to read. And we see that uh, what they are being asked to read is C.D. Broad, um, Bertrand Russell's Logical Atomism, Alexander, Bergson, William James, and later Dewey takes the place of James. Um, experience in nature seems to replace uh, um, the principles of psychology. So it's interesting to see that evolution uh, in, the, in what would be the student's version of a syllabus or reading list, as well as in Whitehead's discussion of those figures over these years, something on which we have no window, I would argue, almost no window whatsoever in process of reality, in science of the modern world, there's actually better windows there um, in religion and the making and so forth. Um, let me skip along here. Um, the, the people I had wanted to look at um, were William James, Bergson, Broad, C.D. Broad, and C. Lloyd Morgan. And I also wanted to do Kant and Hegel there just isn't time. And in fact, I'm nearly out of time right now. So um, uh, I think it's a shame, once again, that Whitehead didn't draw he, 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 um, the Heath notes in volume two, page six, uh, HL2-6, has Whitehead himself citing the opposition of being and nothing in Aristotle and Hegel, uh, approvingly to the credit of both. And um, the uh, uh, as the origin of becoming in process, though Whitehead doesn't credit science, I'm sorry, the science of logic with, with having um, actually had that impact. Um, it's curious to me that he assigned religion in the making to his students right after uh, he had published it. Um, because on the one hand, those seem to be, to me at least, in my reading of them, which has been a long time ago, deeply imbued with the psychological and pragmatic interpretation of religious belief by William James. But unlike invocations of Kant that are in that work, there's no explicit discussion of what, of who Whitehead otherwise calls the adorable James or any citation specifically or quotes from varieties of religious experience and the will to believe. Uh, nonetheless, it, you could say this is an extended commentary uh, on Whitehead's metaphysics and its connection with James' pragmatic view of religious belief. But I'm not the one to comment on that. Jude Jones, uh, Brian's uh, doctoral advisor was at Fordham. I'm sorry she's not here, but she's probably the world's leading expert on that work, so leave it to her. Um, but look at William James, or rather the absence of William James explicitly in process and reality itself. There are three references, three total, in that immense dense work. But we certainly see James and the importance of his many contributions discussed in great detail repeatedly in both volumes HL1 and HL2, and flesh added to that published skeleton of James that Whitehead offers as having, like Descartes, innovated a new age in philosophy in the case of James with his 1904 essay, Does Consciousness Exist? Um, we could reach the same observations with Bergson, discussed in some detail in Science of the Modern World, somewhat brief and passing fashion in process and reality, his termini of, terminology of canalization of thought, but not he himself or cited in the function of reason, as Whitehead sets forth the dialectic of practical and speculative reason that would later blossom into the sweeping uh, Hellenic Hellenistic dialectic in Adventures of Ideas. But those implicit influences are fleshed out explicitly and in much greater detail in his classes of this period, as both HL1 and 2 indicate. 
Um, there are many more mysteries, and I probably don't have time to go into them. I was always curious about how it happened that C.D. Broad wrote such a moving tribute obituary for Whitehead uh, following his death. Uh, what was the relationship between them? Well, that's revealed in the classes. And as Joe and Brian rightly uh, described, they, they do quite a detailed analysis of this in their introduction, but assignments of works like uh, contemporaries like Broad and Russell are part of this project Whitehead has of saying, I'm engaging, in fact, not all the themes that are attributed by subsequent American um, interpreters who knew none of this, didn't know any of this discussion, but I'm engaged in this discussion that was part of the realist idealist debate, uh, the sense data theory in particular, uh, a refutation of Russell's logical atomism as an adequate metaphysics for understanding symbolic reference and perception and, and so forth. We're going about that all wrong. And in order to correct the epistemology, we need a better metaphysics. Um, you got about three minutes. I, I, I think actually what I'd like to do is um, on that note, sort of wrap it up with a commentary on, on what this might mean and actually brings Collingwood back to the fore. Um, you can see Whitehead in these notes in a way I think is very helpful for us who are trying to understand his work, his published work, his radical reorganization of his syllabus and his class each year, uh, reflecting his own thinking, the development in that thinking, um, and the preference to have his students read other public figures in that philosophical debate that he is actually entered in and that and whose relationship to readers in our generation has been lost by an absence of familiarity with um, early British uh, idealism, realist debates and uh, Bradley and internal relatedness and, and so forth and so on. Um, and, and thus coming up, I think, with, with misleading, if not mistaken, uh, inferences about what Whitehead is up to on many occasions. Um, so to, to conclude, I would say that um, looking at this material, uh, you see in Whitehead's metaphysics what Collingwood in his own work would have described as fundamental but implicit background presuppositions. In the published work, they're all there by inference, not by explicit citation. Those presuppositions are never stated explicitly. They're barely discussed or cited, and certainly not discussed in anything like the detail we now find them in his lectures. That fact and the ever-evolving nature of Whitehead's own philosophical synthesis as he gropes his way toward that final version in process of reality during these iterations of allegedly the same course year after year, which is actually, as he notes, quite different year after year, uh, demonstrate that it's really not possible to understand or interpret the significance of those final published works without the benefit of the backstory that Paul and now um, Joe and Brian have brought forth in these two volumes with more to follow. Done. Thank you, George. Let's all give George a round of applause. We're deeply dissatisfying electronically. Uh, <laughs> a round of applause uh, virtually. But let's see, we've got a stack. Looks like Joe is quick on the draw and then, and then Matt. Oh, actually, no, that's not true. I'm looking at that incorrectly. It looks like Matt's first. All right, go ahead, Matt. All right, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, George, thanks so much for uh, engaging in that bit of intellectual history for us. It's so helpful to know who Whitehead was reading because I agree, having the lecture notes and now getting a chance to compare them to what he says in Science in the Modern World and Process in Reality, it's like, he could have been so more, much more explicit in his published work than he was. Um, 
my question for you really is to uh, draw you out a bit more on um, Kant and and Hegel and, and German idealism uh, and how Whitehead draws from it and, and reacted to it. Um, he says in Science in the Modern World already, and, and Ben uh, Ben Snyder beat me to this in the, in the comments, um, that he was upset about the way after Kant, uh, the German idealists didn't really engage with natural science as much as he would have liked. Um, of course, as someone who has studied Schelling uh, quite deeply, I, I feel like he must not have known much about Schelling's uh, work in that area. Um, but nonetheless, uh, then getting to see the uh, lecture notes in HL2 on uh, page 205, October 28, 1926, uh, he refers to, quote, the catastrophe uh, of German idealism um, <laughs> for a different reason, having to do with God as a substance that requires nothing else versus God as being in relationship to the plurality of the world. So. I guess um, my question for you is, well, any reflections on this, but also particularly um, Schelling and the relevance of Schelling for Whitehead. He cites Schelling once, actually, uh, uh, he cites the Russian philosopher Lasky, I think, in Concept of Nature, who's citing Schelling, translating it for Whitehead. So I don't think he read any other Schelling than that, or maybe maybe he did, but we don't know. Um, any comments on, on that, George? I'd, I'd love to hear what you think. In, in a sense, I'm the wrong person to ask about this because I got so many, you know, I talked about how we had to make inferences based on indirect evidence. And my own um, earlier work, you know, decades ago in this regard was, um, even though I can take credit for the, the Hegel-Whitehead connection, or at least for expounding that to an Anglican audience, Anglo-American audience, um, uh, against a considerable amount of skepticism, I might add. Still, I was working in um, all three, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel at the time, and studying that, uh, uh, particularly their understandings of science and nature. Um, and uh, I'd say from Kant to Schelling, I got a lot of that wrong. Um, I underestimated both how well Whitehead understood Kant. And um, again, Brian and I have argued in a, a hospitable way about, you know, Kant's impact and whether Whitehead had him right or not. Um, and we cl he clearly, I think, did not have Hegel right. And I don't think he knew anything about Schelling. And had he known Goethe and Schelling and the uh, Farbenlehre and, and so forth, I, I I think he would have found useful material to buttress and strengthen his own point of view. Uh, and as Nietzsche later said of Darwin, uh, fur on a Hegel, kind Darwin, uh, even though Hegel had no theory of evolution and in fact rejected the then current theories, the Lamarckian theories of his period. Um, so Whitehead, I think, was a victim of um, a one-sided and pretty ignorant polemical uh, presentation of those materials from Schelling through Bradley. Um, he, he, he was not encouraged, shall we say, to delve deeper into them. Uh, and Hegel didn't help matters with some of his uh, less um, um, insightful remarks on, on nature. Still, Hegel's philosophy of nature, when you delve back into it, as more recently scholars have done, is remarkably amicable uh, with Whitehead's process philosophy. It only needs that, uh, um, that sort of impetus, uh, the subject as subject and uh, involvement with uh, nature and the world to make it um, fully compatible, I think, with, with what we now read as Whitehead's view. So, yeah, that's a long-winded answer to say, no, he didn't read Shelley. <laughs> I wish he had. Uh, I think he would have done better there than with, um, than with the little of Hegel that he did apparently look at. I think he says he was with the great biologist clone staying at his house and read one page of Hegel, struck him as complete nonsense. 
<laughs> we don't know what that page was or um, what discussions were had. Um, Joe. Yeah, uh, George, I like that you did uh, talk a little bit about Rod. And I mean, to me, he's such a, a key example of someone who just Whitehead never talked about anywhere. I mean, at least these other contemporary people who he was assigning to his students, we had some idea. I mean, we knew about Samuel Alexander and James and some of these mm. other people he had at least acknowledged in a perfunctory way the influence that they'd had, but we just never got anything abroad. And then we find out that he's been assigned, you know, for the first like seven to 10 years um, of Whitehead's 13 year tenure at Harvard, he'd been assigning Bob's books. And uh, uh, I did want to share one again, uh, something that is upcoming, but um, I'm putting this in the chat. Whitehead gave a, a 1933 exam question where he wanted uh, students to discuss a quote from Broad's Mind and the Place in Nature. Mm -hmm. And the quote goes like this, every system which is certainly known to be at once teleological and mechanistic is an artificial machine. And if we follow its history far enough backwards, we always come to one or more organisms which are teleological, but not certainly mechanistic systems. Um, which is interesting because I think it was Brian who first said in our Whitehead at Harvard volume, characterized uh, Broad as like a foil for Whitehead's philosophy, which I think is very much true. I mean, you can see that in these Harvard lectures, he mostly brings them up to his students to like beat them up a little bit, um, <laughs> particularly that speculative philosophy, uh, his denigration of speculative philosophy. Um, but this just goes to show that he didn't bring him up only to be negative because certainly Whitehead would have agreed with with this, this statement from Broad. Um, so it's just fascinating. I, I, I think there's a lot there that we just never could have known before without the Harvard lectures. And by the by, just to uh, add to that, um, that discussion of mechanism and teleology, which of course is a big theme in Hegel's Science of Logic, but the realist idealist debate in Great Britain and UK in uh, you know, 1910s, 1920s, you look at the pages of Mind uh, the, and uh, the Journal of the Aristotelian Society, you'll see tons and tons of articles back and forth on this question of um, you know, whether any kind of deterministic system necessarily involves a teleological element at some point as you work your way back into its origins and so forth, uh, and contrasting positions on that by uh, just a range of who were then the most influential philosophers in the English-speaking world, uh, including Collingwood but, uh, um, and Broad um, and Russell, uh, and I could go on and on, you know, um, naming all those, those people from that period involved in an intense give and take over this. So Whitehead was immersed in that. And we have no sense in our readings on this side of the pond, having had little, if any of that debate go on here, there's a little bit of the realism debate, uh, Ralph Barton Perry and others uh, who participated in it, but they did it more in the context of American pragmatism. They weren't reading um, these English philosophers, they were more involved, frankly, at Harvard with German, uh, uh, reading Husserl and uh, sending students, including Hartzorn, over to study with Husserl. And so that was great, but, but they weren't involved in the uh, American debate, I'm sorry, in the English language debate. Uh, and thus Whitehead's connection and deep involvement with that is, is lost to us. Thank you for that, Joe. I think we do have one time for one more. Paul, you want to jump in? Uh, George, thank you once again. Uh, I've always appreciated your appraisal of these uh, lecture notes that we've been uh, struggling with. And once again, so thank you. Uh, happily, we're gonna, this is gonna be a continuing journey. We'll see where this goes. I have a fairly obvious question. Uh, 
your contrast was drawn today between the lecture lecture notes and his published works, obviously. But we all know that his published works, so many of them were also composed as lectures. And it seems to me, I'm remembering correctly, Joe may remember uh, somewhere in one of his uh, lectures to his son, North, he described the struggle he's going through to find ways to express what he's got in mind to a public audience, not, not in class philosophy right. students. But a public lecture, and I, you know, I wonder to what extent you would agree that that accounts for a lot of this um, published works that don't look like carefully worked out dissertations with endless footnotes. They really, they they were composed as public lectures, right? And whether that accounts for some of this difference, we're seeing. Yes, I, I think it certainly does, and you can see what the problem would be. I mean, you can't you you can quote uh, brief passages of other thinkers uh, in a public lecture, but you certainly can't cite and go into great detail um, uh, in that in that and, and have any hope of intelligibility, uh, even in process and reality. And what we know or believe we know to be the original drafts of the Giffords. Um, there's he, he's cut way back on what um, of, of the formalisms that end up in process and reality. He's he's giving what was still to his audience uh, a challenging material uh, over a course of a month um, at Edinburgh, but um, he doesn't talk about uh, he doesn't talk about geometry and um, extended continuum to any extent and things like that as he as he does later in the book so that yeah, he's pulling his punches so that he can be you know intelligible to a public audience that means he's going to omit things uh things that he might and does bring up in the lectures so it makes me wonder why he would ever think that it wasn't worth while um having people who really were serious students of his um, study those as well, uh, if they could have them. That's a good note on which to end. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, thank George again. And, and so I'd also, you're, you know, this conversation and your introduction, George, reminded me that it'd be really neat if someday you um, got uh, in your mind to do a, a rehabilitation of Whitehead again, revisited. Mm -hmm um using the new materials that we're discovering and, and what does that say for analytic philosophy and whitehead and the rehabilitation project that you'd started it'd be fun to, to have a, a reprisal of that it uh, should be so inclined but this this you clearly are in the right genre to be centered and moved uh, frequently to be doing it so anyway love to have you do that someday thanks thanks everybody <laughs>